Hi everyone, welcome to this introduction of the cultural studies on communication and culture. This lecture is part of your paper, Media, Culture and Society. This lecture will introduce you to culture as an encompassing subject that constitutes communication. It studies various cultural forms that are communicative and informed by the political moorings of society. This lecture will also inform you about uh, the critical traditions in culture and communication. There are alternative traditions informed by politics, practice and activism. These traditions are premised on culture as a site of change, site of resistance and site of domination. Within the cultural tradition, the Marxist theories have a long history. The vantage point for defining the relationship between culture and media is best exemplifies, and I quote, the ideas of the ruling class are in every epoch the ruling ideas. That is, the class, which is the ruling material force of society, is at the same time its ruling intellectual force. The class, which is the means of material production, at its disposal consequently also controls the means of mental production. The ruling class ideas are nothing more than the ideal expression of the dominant material relations. The dominant material relations grasped as ideas. Hence of the relations which make the one class the ruling class and therefore the ideas of its dominance. This was the basic premise on which further developments in critical theories of media took place. The Frankfurt School, which first gave central attention to the modern means of communication and its cultural effects, has produced an early model of cultural studies during 1930s based on the above Marxist formulation. The Frankfurt School propounded the concept of culture industry, within quote, culture industry, marking a beginning of the critical analysis of culture and communication. Although the Frankfurt School operated within the effect tradition ignoring the aspects of cultural resistance, their work on ideology of cultural industry is extremely significant. Their work emphasized the centrality of ideology in the reproduction of capitalist system through culture industry. They primarily looked at mass culture as assisting capitalist system in ideologically pacifying any possibility of revolution. Culture industry signifies the process of industrialization of mass produced culture. According to them, the cultural commodities produced by cultural industry exhibit the features of factory production, commodification, standardization and massification. The cultural industries had a very specific function of providing ideological legitimation to capitalism and integrating individuals into its framework. Another strand of cultural tradition that emphasized on ideology is semiology, particularly the work of Ronald Barthes. Unlike the Frankfurt School, semiology focused on the processes of signification through symbolic mediation. But semiology too exposed that cultural symbols communicate and reproduce the ideology of capitalism. Science are at the center of semiotics. The study of science is called semiology or semiotics. It looks at three aspects, the sign, the systems into which science are organized, and the culture within which the science operate. Compared to the Frankfurt School, the reader or the receiver of the sign in semiology is uh, accorded a better place, though very limited. Primarily, it focuses on how a sign system is organized and what does it signify. Barthes uses the concepts of connotation and denotation it, uh, to describe the ways to which signification works. The Frankfurt School in semiology both highlighted the political processes of encoding Although they both were inspired by the Marxist theorizations, they completely missed out the alternative ways of decoding and engaging by the oppressed classes and their struggle. 
the scholarly contributions by the Center for Contemporary Cultural Studies in Birmingham addressed this question of working class struggles. It linked the processes of encoding with decoding, thereby acknowledging the role of people in negotiating and persisting the encoded ideology. Scholars like Stuart Hall, associated with the Birmingham Center, should be commended for highlighting the role of people in challenging and resisting the ruling class communicational apparatus, which was hitherto neglected in the critical tradition. By bringing the role of people, they did not move away from the question of ideology. Their questions about culture were concerned with the changing ways of life of societies and groups and the network of meanings that individuals and groups use to make sense of and to communicate with one another. What Raymond Williams once called whole ways of communicating, which are always whole ways of life the dirty crossroad where popular culture intersects with the high arts, that place where power cuts across knowledge or where cultural processes anticipate social change. Communication is not seen as injecting ideas into the minds of passive people. Rather, people are seen as creating their own history through resisting and contesting the hegemony of social and cultural forces of domination. This way they go beyond what is called mass culture and provide a broader perspective to analyze communication and culture, exemplify the political positions as well as scholarly engagement of British left by scholars such as uh, Richard Hogart and Raymond Williams and Stuart Hall and E.P. Thompson. These scholars rejected the Marxist emphasis on economy. They argued that the Marxist consider culture a reflection of economic conditions of any society. Contradicting with this formulation, the Birmingham thinkers exposed that culture is not merely a reflection of economy, but a meaningful process in the construction of social reality. While differing with Marxism on this ground, they did not move away from the central Marxist concerns that its ideology hegemony, capitalism, working class movements, and socialism. The 19th century era, primarily Britain, was undergoing many cultural changes introduced by industrialization and urbanization. Industrialization and the rise of capitalism promoted culture as a commodity to be sold for profit. After the Second World War, the spectacle of capitalism was spreading globally with the emergence of giant corporations like the Coke, the Pepsi, the IBM, the Microsoft, and the nascent computer industry, McDonald's, Nike, and many more global products proliferated and circulated throughout the world. They were basically American. Although with these, the cultural products in the forms of seemingly harmless forms were also distributed at a wide scale, slowing the diversity and promoting homogenization and the American hegemony. Stuart Hall says that in the aftermath of Second World War, Britain was experiencing the cultural trauma. The post-war expansion of the new technologically advanced means of communication and Americanization of culture were generating profound impact on the British society and culture. On the other hand, there were working class movements that were challenging the hegemony of capitalism and were arguing for a more egalitarian socialist society. These two processes were also essential in bringing the question of culture at the center of debate and, and sapping the concerns of cultural studies. Each of these developments have threatened traditional notions of cultural cohesion and social stability. Capitalism threatened to weaken authority through the commercial dismantling of cultural cohesion. The other offered a direct challenge to all forms of political and cultural authority. The British cultural studies aimed at a political goal of social transformation in which a location of forces of domination and persistence would add the process of political transformation. From the beginning, the Birmingham group was oriented towards the cultural political problems of their areas and milieu. Their early spotlight on class and ideology 
derived uh, from an acute sense of the oppressive and systemic effects of class in British society and the movement of the 1960s against class inequality and oppression. Birmingham thinkers were not as disenchanted with the potential of the working class and the Frankfurt School thinkers were. They analyzed the potential of youth subcultures to resist the capitalist domination. Going by this theoretical background of British cultural studies, Stuart Hall propounded the encoding-decoding model. In this model, people engage with the hegemonic cultural forms at different levels. They either conform to it without questioning, or they may negotiate with it and have a completely oppositional viewpoint. This will depend on their social background. For instance, individuals who conform to hegemonic dress and fashion codes, behavior, and political ideologies produce their identities within mainstream groups as members of a particular social groupings, such as white, middle class, conservative Americans. Individuals who identify with subcultures like punk or hip hop look and act differently from those in the mainstream and create oppositional identities, defining themselves against standard models. In this way, they have shown how culture can provide both the tools and forces of domination as well as the resources for assistance and opposition. They stood for preserving the working class culture against the onslaught of cultural industries. E.P. Thompson, in his book, uh, The Making of English Working Class, is one of the classics that inquire the history of British working class institutions and struggles. Thompson looks at uh, the working class as uh, active agents in social transformation rather than corks in the machine. He painted a picture of their lived experiences through various cultural forms such as popular songs and rituals. Williams and Hogarth were deeply involved in activities of working class education and oriented towards socialist working class politics seeing their form of cultural studies as an instrument of progressive social change. Well, the initial critics of the, in the first wave of British cultural studies of Americanism and mass culture in Hogarth, Williams and the Birmingham Center, parallel to some extent the earlier critic of the Frankfurt School, yet celebrated a working class that the Frankfurt School saw as defeated in Germany and much of Europe during the period of fascism and which they never saw as a strong resource for emancipatory social change. This background clarifies that the Birmingham Center's thinkers were not only concerned with uh, interpreting the cultural aspects, but also changing it towards the betterment of society. Well, in addition to this, the Marxist thinkers Louis Althusser and Antonio Gramsci focused on how capitalist systems cause its domination. Althusser coined the term ideological state apparatus to argue that the modern state relies more on ideological tools to rule rather than the repressive methods. And modern means of communication are one the primary ideological tools. Similarly, Gramsci said that the capitalist system maintains its hegemony a control over workers, not by coercive methods, but by cultural conduits. So the relationship between culture and communication in critical tradition is of dominance and resistance. Unlike the European critical traditions, the beginning of critical tradition in the United States lies in the empiricist tradition. James Carey, who is, uh, who is considered the founder of the cultural studies approach to communication research in America, is known for questioning this dominant paradigm, which he calls the transmission view of communication. Against the transmission view, he developed the ritual view of communication. The transmission view, as the, the word transmission suggests, is defined by the terms such as imparting, sending, transmitting. American studies are grounded in a transmission or transportation view of communication. Communication has been defined here as a process of transmitting messages at a distance 
for the purpose of control. According to Carey, the transmission theorists have expressed their concerns on how the continental nation can be held together to function effectively, to avoid dissension into faction or tyranny or chaos. How to cement the union? And the answer to these questions was sought in the word and the will, in transportation and transmission, in the power of printing and civil engineering to bind a vast distance and a large population into cultural unity. The engineering and the communication, therefore, were conceptualized as bringing the continental democracy. Curry calls this the transmission or transportation solution. Communication research in America began as an attempt to explain communication effects. The origin of the effect studies goes back to the First World War. Mass communication research began as a response to a widespread fear of wartime propaganda by the military power. Kerry writes that such fears, alarms, Jeremiah's political pronouncements and the few pieces of empirical research were collapsed into the hypodermic needle model or a bullet theory or a model of unlimited effects of the mass media. The media was seen as possessing extraordinary power to set the beliefs and conduct of people. Therefore, we can see that in transmission view, Communication becomes exemplary case of persuasion, attitude change, behavior modification, socialization through the transmission of information, influence or conditioning. Carey develops a cultural view of communication. For him, communication is a symbolic process whereby reality is produced, maintained, repaired and transformed. By way of this argument, Carey turns to Gir's theory of culture. Kerry also believes that in order to understand the character of social order, one needs to reflect on the capacity of human beings to think and fabricate symbols so as to construct a shared symbolic order. Humans use symbols to construct a culture in which they can live together. Focusing on the symbolic production of reality, Kerry uses a beautiful metaphor for Marcel McLuhan. He says, as the fish is only aware of water, the very medium that forms its ambience and supports its existence, in the same way, we human beings are unaware of communication through language and symbolic forms that comprise the ambience of human existence. Contrary to the transmission view, the ritual or culturalist view of communication emphasizes on representation of shared beliefs than the act of empathic information. It sees the original or highest manifestation of communication not in the transmission of intelligent information but in the construction and maintenance of an order, meaningful cultural world that can serve as a control and container for human action. Query further writes that if, if, the, if the archetypal case of uh, uh, communication under a transmission view is the extension of messages across geography for the purpose of control. The archetypal case under a ritual view is the sacred ceremony that draws persons together in fellowship and commonality. Kerry's culturalist view of communication did not go deep into the power structure of society. Therefore, it suffers from various limitations. Americanization of culture has been a dominant theme in critical studies on culture and communication. So there is a rich tradition of political economy approach in America that focuses on the aspects of production. The American media critic Herbert Schiller and Canadian scholar Dallas Smythe extensively influenced the American critical tradition. Their approach to communication studies drew on both the institutional and Marxian traditions. A concern about the growing size and power of transnational communication businesses places them squarely in the institutional school. But their interest in social class and in media imperialism gives them their work a definite Marxian focus. 
they were less interested in than, for example, European scholars in providing an explicit theoretical account of communication. Rather, their work and through their influence, a great deal of the research in North America has been driven more explicitly by a sense of injustice that the communication industry has become an integral part of a wider corporate order, which is both exploitative and undemocratic. Although Smythe and Siller, we are uh, concerned with the impact of in, in, in North America, they both developed a research program that charts the growth in power and influence of uh, transnational media companies throughout the world. While the American critical tradition has produced a large body of work on, on transnational media corporations and social movements against their dominance. One objective of this work uh, was to advance public interest concerns before government regulatory and policy organs. This includes support for those movements that have taken an active role before international organizations in defense of a new international economic information and communication order. North American communication scholarship has called for a renewed critique of global capitalism including its use of information and communication technologies and its media practices. Well, um, scholars working in this tradition highlight the, the continuing significance and unique vantage point of Marxism for media and communication studies. While those who employ a Marxian framework do disagree on some of these specifics, they all insist on the necessity of including power and social class relations in media and communication studies, as well as committing to praxis by combining research and action to advance a more democratic society. Friends, you have read about the various trends within the critical theories of culture and communication. We mainly discuss the Marxist theories, the Frankfurt School, the semiotics, British cultural studies, the American cultural studies, and the political economy approach, and their differences and commonalities to engage with culture and communication. For more details, please read the e-text of this lecture properly, and also attempt the questions that are given at the end of the e-text. Thank you very much indeed.